so, so good, so good, so uh, You knew that the only time we could sing a song that I'm broken is to have all men on the stage. <laughs> Wouldn't get away with it otherwise, but uh, you know, we're, we're in the midst of a series, Twisted, and uh, last week I talked about the twisted perspective of, of sex that, that we have in our culture. Today I want to talk to you about the twisted perspective of sin, and some of you, maybe this is your first time, maybe it's your first time watching, and you're going, great, just what I thought about these preachers. Don't sin. Uh, I wish I could command you not to do that. I wish you could command me not to sin. It would be so much easier. But, uh, but I actually want to talk about really what it means to have a clear perspective of the freedom that Christ has given us. And if you're watching online or you're a guest here, text me. At 313131, just type in the word guest, and I'll give you a call this week. I'd love to get a chance to talk to you. I'm sorry about last weekend. Did not get to call the guest. I'll be calling them this week. We had a bunch of stuff going on, uh, kind of uh, uh, unexpected. And so I'll give you a buzz uh, this week. So just go ahead and text the word guest to 313131. For all of you who call Grace home, Man, make sure you're looking at your bulletin or you get here a little bit early before the service and see the rundown or you can go watch it on Facebook Live or live stream. There are just a variety of ways that you can stay connected here at Grace and need to because there is so much happening here and in the community, okay? And, uh, you know, maybe maybe your bracket is still going, right? You know, uh, Billy decided to sit in the front row today because he's got his Duke shirt on. And my Tar Heels laid a really bad egg uh, the other day. But uh, if your team don't play defense today, they ain't going anywhere. I just want you to know that. Uh, the last two games haven't been good deep. So, uh, but but here, here's the deal. You know, we, we like to have fun. We enjoy what we do around here. We don't take ourselves too serious. But we do take what God has to say very serious. And um, when you talk about something, I, I put it on the sign. You see it there on the outline. Stop calling it a mistake. Stop calling it a mistake. You know, uh, this morning I got a call from someone. Oh, there's my granddaughter. Honey, don't do that to me. Look, she, everybody turn around and see her back there. Hi, Rain. Hi, baby. Oh, my gosh. So unfair. <laughs> Bring her up here. So uh, this morning I got a call from my son, uh, my oldest son, and, and just uh, was getting ready to actually hop in the shower here and get ready for the day, and I slam my finger against the shower, cut it open. That's a mistake, okay? That's a human error. But a lot of times, that's how we treat sin. We go, well, it's just a mistake. You know, I just accidentally slept with her, even though she's not my wife. I just accidentally got my 22nd DUI. I just accidentally, you know, embezzled $300,000, And I don't mean to laugh, but this is an American problem. It's a huge problem in North America. It's a huge problem in the church. And and since I'm a preacher, I get to make up words, okay? So you're you're not a mistaker. And being a mistaker or calling yourself a mistaker will keep you in a prison, Christian. And for those of you who don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I want you to know that he loves you. Uh, Jesus died for all of your sins. He paid for them 2,000 years ago. He rose again. You can have everlasting life by trusting in him. But you'll still have the same struggle I have every day. And everybody else has. And that is that sin is still present in our lives. You ever come to that place in your life where you realize how broken you are? You know, I'm listening to the lyrics of that song. I like that you're broken, broken like me. Maybe that makes me a fool. I like that you're lonely, lonely like me. Misery loves company. We're all broken. I still remember the first time I recognized the difference between sin and a mistake. When I was uh, around eight, eight and a half years old, we lived over on 44th and Yates in a little duplex. And uh, if you're familiar with North Denver, uh, there's alleys behind all the old houses. And so one day I, you know, told my mom I didn't feel good. I kind of fibbed a little bit. And uh, Okay, Ricky, you stay home. My little brother went to school. It's a beautiful spring day. About 45 minutes later, I was miraculously healed. And my mom was a little bit of a pushover back then. Yes, you were. And I'm like, 
you know, Mom, I feel better. Can I go outside? Oh, I don't think. Yeah, Mom, just a little bit. Okay. So I went outside. Here's the problem. When you fake that you're sick when you're a kid, you're so excited to miss school, but you realize all your friends are there. So, you know, you can't have any fun anyway. So I'm out in the alley, and I'm, I'm picking up rocks, and I'm throwing them at the pole, the light pole. And then I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I can knock that light out. <clears throat> so I start throwing rocks at the light. And there was this guy that lived across the street. He had a 1938 coupe with a little window, you know, those old, you know, coupes. And, and I took the rock, and I threw it as hard as I could, and it went over the light, and then all of a sudden I heard, Psh! And I sort of bought into the premise that if you don't see it, it didn't happen. So I just went straight back to the house. I'm like, Mom, I feel worse. Oh, I feel terrible. She's like, okay, you go back to bed. I knew you were sick. Lay down, you know. I was so premeditated in my sin, I faked it all day. About 4, 35 o'clock, my dad comes home. He checks on me. He's being real sympathetic. About 6 o'clock, guy comes to the door. Uh, yeah, your son was out in the alley throwing rocks. My dad's like, no, he was in bed. He's been sick all day. No, he was in the alley. People saw him throwing rocks. Dad's like, Ricky, come here. Get up. Ah, it's like, were, were you out in the alley? And apparently my mom in eight hours had forgotten that I went out for a brief spell. I'm like, no, no. Guy's like, he, I, he broke my window. Dad's like, no, don't call my son a liar. Shuts the door. That was it. That's my recollection, right? So I go back to bed. I'm like, yes. Now, I got away with it, right? Yeah. A few, few months later, I came to know Jesus as my Savior. Five years later, I went to a Christian youth camp. I was a teenager, you know, at this Christian youth camp. And the, the speaker starts talking about, you know, if you have sin in your life as a Christian, it's unconfessed, you haven't, you haven't really let it out, it keeps you in a prison. And he says, is there anything you feel guilty about? I'm like, mm, yeah. And I started thinking, okay, I'm going to confess this. God, I did it. And he's like, yeah, I know. Confession means to say it is so. All right, you're just admitting what he already knows. And then I went, I got to tell my mom. Now, you forget kid years compared to adult years are very different. It's like dog years. Like kid years last seven years. Adult years, when you're over 30, last like two weeks. So for me to go to my mom and say, hey, mom, you remember way back five years ago? She's like, uh-huh. When that window got broke way back there when I was a little kid? Yeah, I did it. My mom's like, I can't believe you lied to me. So my mom and dad gave me the talk about lying. I got in trouble, suffered some consequences. I don't know. I'm, couple days grounded, whatever. Here's what happened. I was free. I admitted it. I said it to my parents. And it's never been anything but a sermon illustration since then. No guilt. No prison. Now, you might think, preacher, I wish the worst thing I did was break a window at eight. Me too, by the way. All right? But here's the reality. I came to a place in my life where I understood that sin needs to be called for what it is. It needs to be named. Quit saying it's a mistake and start saying it's sin. In the book of Romans, in the end of chapter 7 and all of chapter 8, Paul the Apostle, Paul the Apostle, I mean, arguably the most influential person in human history apart from Jesus Christ himself, writes the Bible under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He writes it as a believer, as an inspired, apostolic believer, and he talks about the struggle that you and I have. And midway through Romans 8, he talks about the effects of sin on our culture. I want you to look at this. You can look on your outline, turn to your Bibles, or you can look on the screen. Look here in Romans 8. Here's a twisted perspective. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. I want you to circle God's curse. That happened with the first man and the first woman when they chose poorly, and we've all been infected with the curse. But with eager hope, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. I've never given birth to a child, but I've watched my wife deliver four. I've watched my daughter deliver three, my daughter-in-law two. 
I mean, I wasn't in there, but I watched them all the way up to that point. And let me tell you something. Number one, I'm thank God I'm a man. And number two, there is no kind of pain or struggle like that. And when God says, that's how the earth is groaning, I get the picture. He says, and the Father who knows all the heart knows what spirit the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to the purpose, his purpose for them. Now, I want to make something perfectly clear. If you're living a life that is, as a Christian, unconfessed, you have, guys, we're going to get really theological for a minute because it's important. You have positional forgiveness. The moment that you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and you trust in him, the Bible says, Ephesians 1, you are seated in the heavenlies. Remember, God lives outside the realm of time and space. What happened, has happened, is happening, and will happen within God. Make sense? <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's very difficult. All right? So here's the reality. God lives outside the realm of time and space. So he already sees me as in Christ in heaven. That's called positional forgiveness. All right? The moment I believe, I receive it. And you don't keep believing and keep begging. You trust in Christ, you're born again. Now, there's practical forgiveness. It's just like in a relationship. My wife and I love each other. We're committed for life. We've been married almost 34 years, but we still have fights and we still have struggles and we still sin against each other. We have positional forgiveness. We've made a commitment to be together for life. But our practical forgiveness is we say we've sinned against each other. We ask for forgiveness. We admit it. Same is true with God. He'll never sin against you. He can't. It's against his nature. He's perfect. But you and I will sin. All right? So practical forgiveness is that day-to-day -day recognition of the fact that I'm a sinner. Now, let's talk about this. Jesus came along, and all of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious hypocrites, were making everybody believe that spirituality was all about the outside, the external. They went to the temple. They gave lots of money. They dressed a certain way. Heck, they wore phylacteries on their head, a little box with the Pentateuch in it, the first five books of the Bible, roll in a little scroll. They thought that made them holy. And they would tell everybody, you must be like us. And Jesus comes along and he says, uh, let me make something perfectly clear. Your standard of holiness was if a man commits adultery then, or a woman commits adultery, he should be able to divorce her. I say if you think lustfully about a person, you've committed adultery already. And, and by the way, if that hasn't happened, then he levels the playing ground here. Look at this. You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot when they cut you off on the drive over to church, and you just might find yourself hauled into court, thoughtlessly to yell stupid at a sister, and you are on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. Jesus raised the level of sin to a degree where all of us are under the bar. None of us can say about either of these, lust or hate, that we haven't experienced them multiple times. All right? So why did he do that? Because he was trying to point us, first of all, to himself, and secondly, to a life of contrition. I'm not talking about a life where you say, oh, I'm pathetic, I'm horrible, I'm terrible. It's not this self-deprecating false humility. It's an open honesty before God that says, thank you, God, my perfect God, for loving me and forgiving me and giving me salvation. And you know what, Lord? Today, it wasn't a good day. And I'm just, I'm just owning it. Things I said, things I did, I'm owning it. But he says you do that so you can have freedom. Now, I want to show you something real quick. Here's a twisted perspective we see in these scriptures. And I, I just kind of narrow them down to the three Ps. I didn't list it that way. I just call it the twisted perspective. Here's the first one in our culture. Profane thoughts are just natural desires. Oh, everybody thinks that way. Now, I want to make something clear. Just because a thought comes in your mind doesn't mean it's sin. But dwelling on it is. 
You know you have a struggle. You know you have an addiction. You know you have an obsession. You know you have a fantasy you can't seem to shake. You don't dwell on it. We just say in our culture, oh, it's just normal. It's just natural. That's a lie. Second is a predisposed wrongs are just part of my maturation. Boy, do we tell kids that, especially boys. Oh, boys will be boys. I remember sitting with my 16-year-old friend. Barry and I grew up in the same neighborhood. There were eight of us guys. We were all within like two and a half years of each other. And I remember sitting with my friend Stan while his dad said, you need, at 16, you need to have sex with as many girls as possible before you get married. I'm like, uh, that's going to set him free in a really bad way. And you know what's sad about it? That was just the beginning of what destroyed his life. Predisposed wrongs are not just part of maturation. Yes, it's true that, a, that according to neuroscience, a man's brain, a male brain, does not fully form until around the age of 24. And a female brain doesn't fully mature until around the age of 38. No, I'm just kidding. 21. <laughs> 21. Don't get all excited just because it's three years earlier, all right? But, but here's reality. Um, just because our brain hasn't fully formed doesn't mean we're not responsible for the decisions that we make. And finally, premeditated choices are just mistakes. You know, I'd shared this in the last two services. I really debated whether or not I was going to share it in here. But, you know, people don't just wake up one day and go, oh, I'm going to be a serial killer. Oh, I'm going to wreck my family with this addiction. Oh, I'm going to, you know, find somebody that's not my spouse to have sex with. I'm going to go take money from my company. You don't wake up and do that. That's Hollywood, okay? It's not reality. Ted Bundy was the most prolific serial killer in history. And many of us who grew up in the 60s and 70s and 80s remember the heinous crimes that he committed against women in Utah, mostly in Washington, and in Colorado. And Ted Bundy was a guy that fooled everybody. On the outside, he looked like an up-and-coming politician. He was a lawyer uh, going to law school. He, was, uh, he had his psychology degree. I mean, he appeared on the outside to be as much together as you could possibly be. But on the inside, since he was 15, he'd been murdering girls. And by the time he was executed in 1989, he said he'd killed 130 women. They're not sure it wasn't upwards of 200 or more. Because within the radius of where he lived, women disappeared all over the place. Now, here's the point. When he talked to Dr. James Dobson before he died, he said he had an obsession and an addiction to pornography. We know, obviously, that played into this. But here's what really happens. When he was 14, he killed a cat and tortured it, or tortured it and then killed it. Then he started entertaining the thoughts of the girl that lived four houses down who was 12. And once he got away with that, it just continued to snowball. You see, a thought that we dwell on, profane as it may be, becomes a desire. And a desire becomes an action. And an action becomes a habit. And a habit becomes a way of life. So by the time you get to that point, where whatever it is has imprisoned you, you've gone through five phases to get there. It's critical that we understand that. And stop saying it's a mistake. It's not just a mistake. And until we say, as a believer, or whether you're a non-believer, it's sin. And see, let me explain something. It's very easy in our culture. I mean, if you haven't noticed, we excuse everything now. It's everybody else's fault. It's the government's fault. It's the president. Man, President Trump, it's got to be his fault. He's definitely the person, right? It's Congress. It's this person. It's that person. It's my spouse. It's my kids. It's the economy. We are blamers, and we are mistakers. And as long as you live there, you will be, and I'll show this at the end, the perpetual victim. And you'll never have victory. 
You have to own it. You have to own it. For your marriage to be healthy, for your relationships to be healthy, for you to be healthy, for your finances to be healthy, you got to own it. And I want to show you how the Apostle Paul owned it, had victory in his life, and how you and I have the same opportunity right now. And in order to do this, we got to almost go back to where we went last week and start with a truth check. God says this. I want you to write this down. This is critical. I was made in God's perfect image. You were made in God's perfect image. You are not a product of chance. You are not an accident. In the weeks ahead, I'm going to talk about is Satan real? What is, you know, what is this world we live on really made up of? You know, is science uh, accurate in all of its assessments or theories? Is the Bible accurate? And, and let me say this. Uh, it's interesting how evolutionists believe that if you throw more time at something, you can explain it. When science itself says time is not our friend. More time doesn't make time. If I take this watch apart and I smash it into a million pieces and I throw it into space, it is not going to eventually find itself back together. That is not science. That's insanity. The other day, I read that the earth is now 14.4 billion years old. Apparently, 4.4 billion wasn't enough. Let me tell you something. You don't have enough time to prove to me that four gases in the universe came together, exploded, created this amazing blue planet with exactly 77% water with exactly the right oxygenation of trees that tilted it on its axis, that spun it at the exact rate that if we were leaning any further toward the sun, we'd burn up, any further away, we'd freeze to death. There is no way you're going to convince me that happened by chance. I don't care how many words you use, how many doctorates you have, how many letters before or after your name. God created us. Look at this in Genesis 1. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike. We're not gods, but we're like him. Reflecting God's nature, circle that. He created them male and female. And by the way, did you notice how he said, let us make man in our image? Our God is one God manifest in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Write this down. Human nature is not the same as the sin nature. I had somebody come up to me. Um, she was actually my teacher in high school. Goes to church here. She came up to me and said, can you help me with a few more verses and passages on, on this? And so we talked about it. Here's what we need to understand. Our human nature, our behaviors that have not been programmed, obviously, by worldview and culture, our tastes and likes and dislikes and sense of humor and quirky uh, innate abilities, those are not sinful. Those were created in the image of God. Our sin nature is not our human nature. Our sin nature is the disease that infected our human nature. Does that make sense? Think of it this way. You know, whatever I put in this glass is for me to know and you to find out. <laughs> it's water, okay. Um, whatever is in here takes on the shape of this cup, all right? What I put in here is what this cup holds, in the same way, what I put in my body, what I put in my soul, is what makes me who I am. If we think of our body, just think of us right now as the human nature created in the image of God. We now have been infected with something called the sin nature. The Apostle Paul understood that. And as an apostle, as a Christian, he says something. And i got to tell you this. This is... Uh, this is extraordinary. Years ago, 35 years ago, uh, 36 years ago, I met a guy, uh, a man in our church. He was 
one of the elders. He was very involved. He had a daughter that went to school with me. Her name was Shelley Bartholomew. And um, his, he, he had adopted her because her dad died at four. And Bill Ferguson had adopted her and raised her as his own. And Bill was this guy I just really loved. He was funny, a kind of charming guy, rough and gruff, cowboy type. I used to work at, on, during certain summers. I'd go do odd jobs for him and Gene and uh, loved their daughter. Woo. And uh, so I'd go over there anytime I could. And, uh, and then I started dating her. And all of a sudden, he turned into the devil. Now, I get it. I am a father of two daughters and three granddaughters. There's nobody good enough for your daughter. There's definitely nobody good enough for your granddaughter. But I didn't understand that then. So I started dating Shelly. Uh, he didn't like me. Then I asked her to marry, m- marry me. Then he really doesn't like me. Then I marry her. He can't stand me. And all of a sudden, man, I'd go over to the house, and he'd make fun of me and put me down. People would be there I didn't even know. And, man, I'd get angry, and I knew I couldn't fight back. And I'd get in the car and drive home and say, man, your dad's a jerk. I'm never going back there. My wife would say, you're such a baby. <laughs> Suck it up, buttercup. And I'd go back, and it'd happen again. All right? So this is how it was for about six or seven months. And then we get this call. We go over to the house, and... Sitting on the couch in tears, he says, I have terminal bone cancer, and they gave me six months to live. And my wife is devastated, and of course, I'm devastated for her. I'm obviously sad for him, but there was no heart connection. Well, I'll just jump ahead. Some of you know the story. It's in my book, obviously, but he he lived a lot longer than six months. He lived five and a half years. And he lived pretty normal in a lot of pain, but you'd never know it. Tough guy. And during that time, we, we got closer and closer. We eventually moved in. We were going to Bible college. And one day I come home from college, and he's reading this passage. See, he was a Christian. He knew he was going to heaven. But he still hadn't really allowed God to take control of his life. He still called everything a mistake until this passage. Look at this in Romans 7. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. Circle that. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Anyone relating to this other than me? Okay? But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Now, he's not blaming sin. He's explaining the reason. He says, it is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Just stop there for a minute. Ouch. Dang, that hurts. And by the way, you're not alone. Okay? You ever feel like just a colossal failure? I do. I mean, I've been a pastor for 33 years, and there are still days I go, I still do that? I still do that? I still say that? I still act that way? I'm still that selfish? Okay, But there's a difference between a person that says, God, I still do that. Lord, thank you for loving me anyways. And a person that says, that's just how I am. And I'm going to keep doing it. Look at this. I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. That power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Now you're getting an explanation. You're like, okay, I get it. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. I love that. That's underlined, circled in my Bible, and my name is written above it. So you see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. So now there is no, 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 no. We're going to read this out loud together. Everybody home, everybody here. Here we go. Start with so. Ready? So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation that you're a sinner. The condemnation was thrust on Jesus 2,000 years ago. All of our sin and death on him 2,000 years ago. No condemnation. So what's he saying? It sucks sometimes to be a sinner and still struggle with it. It does. So own it. 
Own it. Don't say I'm a mistake or say I'm a sinner. Guys, if you have spent your whole life, and by the way, every person that's not a Christian is sinful and depraved. We'll look at that in a minute. You say, wait, I know a lot of lost people. They're not Christians. They're not religious. They're better than most of the Christians I know. No, they're not, because everything they do, they do for self. Until God is the center of your life and Jesus is your Savior, you and I are lost in our sin. The moment we come to Christ, now we have a choice. So if every day I'm a sinner, this is the body of death I'm wrapped in, and this is my sin nature. Let's say I just work out my right arm every day. 20 pounds for a month, 40 pounds for a month, 60 pounds, 80 pounds, 120 pounds. Man, this, this sin nature is strong. I want something, and even if it's wrong, I go get it. That's my sin nature. Now I come to know Jesus as my personal Savior. I've got a new nature. Jesus lives in me in the Holy Spirit. The new nature is supernaturally powerful. The Holy Spirit lives in me. The power that raised Jesus from the dead created the universe. I mean, that's power. But i got to learn how to yield to it. And i got to learn how to allow it to control my life. Him, not it. Him, excuse me. So this is my new nature. Here's what you have to do. got to build habits in your life. That's why we go to church. That's why we get involved and serve. That's why we get in a small group. We read the Bible. We pray. Not, to, not, not, not because doing that action makes you holy, because it teaches you how to live holy. If I'm not living it, it doesn't matter how much I read the Bible, okay? So now I'm building this arm, this new nature, but this one's strong. When I'm a new Christian, you know, about six months, the honeymoon's like, oh, I'm going to be there every time the doors are open. And then about the seventh month, it's like, it's really nice out today. And the new the sin nature's like, yeah, heck yeah, let's go do this and let's go do that. And it beats down your new nature. Your new nature's like, okay, I'm going to stay it, it, that's true. We know it, right? This isn't rocket science, okay? So you got to remember, you were created in the image of God, but you have a sin nature, but there's no condemnation. So write this down. My sin nature is impossible to escape. Until I get to heaven, my sin nature has me in its grasp. Now that doesn't mean I have to allow it to control me. Look at Romans 3.23. For all have sinned, everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. All means all. Okay? There's nobody that can point a finger at anybody and say, well, I'm not a sinner. So write this down. Depravity isn't a choice, but a depraved life is. Depravity, simplest way I remember it, being born and bent a certain direction. Depravity means I was born and bent to sin. Do you know this? And this is going to sound really strange. You grew up in America, a place that was actually influenced by the Bible, our laws, okay? Which means you were taught a moral compass before you were a Christian. Not everybody in the world has that, okay? So what that means is this. You were born just like me. You have one bent, one direction to sin. Do you know you don't even have a free will? The only person that had a free will was Adam and Eve. And they chose poorly. And so we were all born dead, depraved by sin. The moment we believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit gives us that ability. Now we have the ability supernaturally to say, yes, I'm depraved, but I don't have to live a depraved life. Look at Romans 3.24. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he, what, guys? Freed us from the penalty of our sins. Circle that. Freed us. So, I'm a sinner. I'm not a mistaker. Look at Romans chapter 8. Paul goes on to say this. After he says, man, I'm a mess, and I, things I don't want to do, I keep doing. The things I want to do, I don't do. Now, if you live there, you're going to be a walking, talking victim and excuse. You don't have to be. You know, we're starting to celebrate recovery after Easter. You can break free of your addictions, your hurts, and your habits. It is not a viable excuse to say, well, I'm a Christian. I know I'm going to heaven, and this is just who I am. I'm going to keep doing it. God says, I gave you victory. Walk in that victory. 
Look at Romans 8. It's not easy, but you can do it. Look at this. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. See, religion won't save you. Going to church, obeying the law, that's like looking in a mirror and going, oh, my face is dirty. I think I'll take the mirror off the wall and wash my face with it. You can't. That's the law. It shows you your sin. Look at this. I'm deep, right? I mean, super intelligent stuff coming out of my mouth, all right? So here we go. So God did this. He said, He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us. Wow, that's, that's, that's deep. Who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Now, let me just tell you, there'll never be a point in your life, this side of eternity, that you're always controlled by the Spirit and never sin. 1 John talks about if we walk in the light, we, we do what's right. If we walk in the darkness, we do what's wrong. And people go, oh, well, see, if you, you have to live a godly life or you won't go to heaven. If that's true, we're all going to hell because it says you've got to be perfect. What it's talking about is you have a new nature. It is perfect before God. But you've got to battle every day with the sin nature and the three enemies, the flesh, the world, and the devil. Write this down. My only hope was taking Jesus' perfect nature as my own. That's the only hope. The mistaker concept wants religion. Do you know why people run after religion? Because I have to do something. You ever, you ever talk to people who aren't Christians and they're like the most religious people you know? They're always at this confession. or ma- And I'm not just talking Catholicism. They're at some other church. Oh, they got to go through this penance and they got to go to confession. They, do a, they feel so horrible about themselves. You know why they go through that? So they can go live like hell the rest of the week. You know it. Religion won't save you. It won't set you free. My only hope is Jesus' nature. Look at Romans 8. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. If you want to know for sure whether or not you're a Christian, then ask this question, does the Spirit of God live in me? You're going, well, how do I know that? I'll tell you in a minute. Look at this. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Write this down. Salvation is a birth, but a changed life is a choice. See, the moment you believe, people ask me this a lot. Well, wait a second. I believe in Jesus every day. That's not what saves you. But I, I, you know, I'm having faith every day. That's not what saves you. You have to come to a place in your life where you come to the end of you. And at the end of you, you say, I'm a sinner. And I realize there's nothing I can do to save myself. Guys, I don't just say these things at the end of a message because, you know, it's Rick's little speech. It's actually what the Bible says we must do. I'm a sinner. There's nothing I can do to save myself. I am at the end of me, Jesus. I believe you died for me. That you were buried and you rose again. And I trust in what you did 2,000 years ago to save me. In that moment, you are born again. That moment is your moment of salvation. That's why I tell people, write it down, tell somebody. Some of you say, I can't remember the exact moment. Do you remember that time period in your life where you came to the end of you and put your trust in Jesus? If not, you need Jesus. Because if you think it's a process, you missed it. It is a birth. Now, once I've been born again, guess what? Now I have a new nature. And look at Galatians 2.20. My old self has been... Oh, wait, back up. Look at Romans 8 real quick. 
So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him daddy. That's what Abba means. Daddy, father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. All of the riches of all of heaven are at your fingertip. You're struggling financially? God says, I can provide. You're hurting physically? God says, I can heal. Your relationships are broken? God says, I can bring them back from the dead. He is the one who says, all of my riches are at your fingertip. And that's what he's talking about. When I go up to a Christian, I say, how are you doing? And they say, well, under the circumstances. I want to grab them and go, what the heck are you doing under the circumstances? You're a Christian. You don't have to live under the circumstances. You can cry about it and cry and and, and talk to somebody and pray, but you, my friend, are victorious over the circumstances. Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. So when Jesus died 2,000 years ago, you were there. When he was dying on the cross, he had your face in his mind. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in his earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And by the way, the next verse in that chapter, the last verse of chapter 2, is one of the most powerful verses in Scripture. I do not set aside the grace of God. If righteousness could be attained by obedience to the law, Christ died in vain. I can't attain it. I must receive it. The moment I do that, I am now a new creation. I have a new nature. I can feed this new nature. I can work this new nature out. And I can starve this sinful nature. Now, here's the news. I hate to break it to you. It'll never die completely until you get to heaven. Those are those days where you go, I'm a preacher and I said that. I'm a Christian and I did that. Okay? It's not a mistake. It's a sin. That's why 1 John 1, 9 is written to Christians, not the lost. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That is practical forgiveness and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Guys, let's end with this. I can have victory over sin and guilt. That's the truth. You can have victory over sin and guilt today. Jesus did not just die for your sin. He died for the guilt of your sin. I'm in that room with my father-in-law, and I'm, I'm explaining Romans 7. He's sitting there going, Rick, I've never seen this. You know, he's a guy that came to know Christ 14 years before, and he had the mouth of a trucker. He had a crazy lifestyle. And there were things in his life he just had not yielded to the Spirit of God, just like the rest of us, but some of them were pretty glaring. And here he was, literally near death, And I sat there and I explained it and and we prayed and it was amazing. I got up to leave and he always called me boy. He never even called me my name. Got to the door. Hey, boy. Yeah. He looks at me and goes, son, I love you. I said, Bill, I love you. Our relationship for the next two and a half years went to a completely different place. When he died, June 25th, 1990, I went in that room, that hospital room, took my Bible, my wife, my friend Greg, my mother-in-law, and I said, Bill, are you ready to die? And he said, I'm ready. And I remember thinking, I'm not afraid of death, but I'm not ready right now. How do you get ready? How do you honestly come to the end of you and go, I'm ready? Okay? What it was is not only did he know Jesus had saved him from hell. He knew now that everybody sins and that a life of confession and contrition to God is freedom. Do you know what he did the next day? They got on the phone and he called friends and family members and relatives who couldn't get there and he said, listen, this is Bill. Your brother Bill, your uncle Bill, your cousin Bill, you're not going to make it. I should be dead by tonight, maybe tomorrow. (laughs) This is a room full of people in there. They're just visiting. We're all hanging out. And he goes, but if you want to see me again, you need to believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and trust in him. Hey, got to go. He did that for about two hours. 
Why? Because he was sure of his salvation. Because he knew God loves us as sinners. Guys, he was victorious. Not because he never sinned again. Because sin no longer had control over him. There is a difference between saying, oh, it's a mistake, but I'm going to keep doing it. And it's a sin, and God will want victory over it. Look at Romans 8. What shall we say? You ever get discouraged? Just read this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? The answer is no. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? You are a victorious survivor, and you're a victorious sinner. Listen, transformed believers live by faith, not by sight. Man, if I keep looking in the mirror and looking at the stuff I do, it's scary. But I keep looking at Jesus. And I know that yesterday might have been a rough day, but today can be a new day. Last hour could have been a failure hour, but this hour can be a victorious one. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we live by believing and not by seeing. You keep your eyes on this world. You keep your eyes on your addiction. Keep your eyes on your illness. You keep your eyes on your financial bank, you know, your, your bank account. You're going to be a discouraged person. And God says, why are you looking over there? You remember when Peter was walking on the water for a few steps? What happened? He took his eyes off of Jesus, and he put his eyes on the storm. He prayed the shortest prayer, Lord, help! And Jesus did. Mistakes are con mistakers are constant victims of blame, but sinners are constant victors by belief. You are an overcomer. And you're not an overcomer by what you do. You're an overcomer by why you do what you do. Look at 1 John 5 and we'll close in prayer. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. Maybe you're here and you hear all this talk about sin. Maybe you're thinking right now that you're not sure if you were to die, whether or not you'd go to heaven. My friend, you can leave here positive. And it's not by anything you've done. It's by everything Jesus did. Right where you sit, you can just talk to God in your mind. Say something like this, God, I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. But today, this last day of March, I believe Jesus Christ died for me. I believe he's risen. And right now I trust in him as my only hope of going to heaven. Friend, in the very moment you believe, you receive salvation. You're going to heaven. And I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward. I just want you in a moment, I'm going to have you raise your hand and put it right back down. That just tells me you got it. So if you're saying today, I believe Jesus Christ died for me and today, I trust in him and receive that free gift. Would you slip your hand up and put it right back down? Bless you. God bless you. Many hands. God bless you guys. Welcome to the family of God. I'm going to tell you this. I, I meant to say it in the message. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Here's how you know the Holy Spirit lives in you. Because you now understand the things that are sin that before you thought were okay. Because you have a clearer understanding of what's wrong and what's right. That's the greatest litmus test. You want to know if you're a Christian? Have you put your trust in Jesus? You want to know the Holy Spirit lives in you? It's not some bizarre behavior. It's knowing that, oh, you know what? 
I used to do that, and it's wrong. And now I see that. Lord, give me strength to say no to it today. If you put your trust in Christ, I'd love to talk to you. You can text me the word believe to 313131. Just text the word believe to 313131. I'll give you a call this week. Love to welcome you to the family of God and answer any questions. Christians, we are sinners saved by grace. And the sooner we start being honest and walking that way, the greater the freedom will be. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We worship you now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.